Well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, great to be with you today. I want to wish you a uh, um, a happy Good Friday. Today is the day that we celebrate the uh, um, the death of Christ on the cross. And when I say celebrate, it it is um, it is truly a, in one moment a celebration for all that God has done for us, and at the same point, it is a time of reflection as well. And um, the gospel is such an incredible. Um, an incredible thing you know the matthew mark luke and john are the, are the four gospels that begin in the new testament and tell the story of jesus from his birth all the way up to his death and his resurrection and uh, and his ascension and and so we finished the book of matthew yesterday and it's really fitting for us to jump from from matthew over to judges why because in in the new testament we've been made available the opportunity to become the children of God, right? Become the chosen people of God. That's what that's what scripture actually talks about. When we are born again, when we um, enter God's family, we are part of the chosen people. Now, now, God still relates to us very much in the same way that he did um, his Old Testament people, uh, the chosen people. And, and we make a big mistake in separating those out, but they're not separated out. God relates to his people in the exact same way. It's just that God sent Jesus to die on the cross for us that we would become um, made new and he became the sacrifice instead of the people having to go to the high priest all the time and uh, having sacrifice of goats and lambs. Jesus became that sacrifice, which was in this incredible reality and it made for the opportunity for us to not have to keep going back and getting, you know, taking sacrifices, but also this reality that that his sacrifice was even greater. He gave us the opportunity to actually have have um, have heart change, um, where his sacrifice was was once for all, and also it its impact was greater than the the sacrifice of of um, animals uh, for us. And so, uh, what's interesting is you go back to the book of of uh, Joshua, and God's bringing his cho- his people, his chosen people, into what the promised land. And he says to them, now, as you're coming into the promised land, here's a couple of ground rules that are extremely important for you. If you want to live within the blessing of God, um, you're not to you're not to worship their gods and you're not to intermarry with them. You, you, you make no treaties with them. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your sons and your daughters in a marriage with them because they will lead your your hearts astray. So be careful who you make alignment with. And then also, you know, just you, you've got to make sure that you are not worshiping their gods. Something again that that the people of God really struggle with today. If I were to, if we were to be honest, well, the book of Judges shows what happens um, in Deuteronomy. Moses before they before they are led in uh, with Joshua, the book of Deuteronomy. Moses gives them the second law, gives them the, the law a second time, and he reiterates. He reminds. Um, all of this new generation that's going into the promised land, he reminds them, listen, the blessing of God is in front of you. It, it lays in front of you. It's on the horizon. But let me warn you again, if you get over there and you you do those things that, that he told you not to do, all the curses that came upon Egypt are, are going to end up coming upon you because you are living outside of what is acceptable as a child of God, as, as one of God's chosen people. Listen, that has not changed. And so I think it's very important for us to watch what happens in the book of Judges because what ends up happening individually ends up happening corporately. What ends up happening corporately and ends up happening community-wise. And and it impacts the entire community. And that's why we're seeing the demise of our community today, the complete fracturing of it. Um, it is because we are we're going through the same process of what of what they did in the book of Judges. And that process is they got over there and they started intermarrying. They started worshiping their false gods and, um, and started making uh, you know, treaties and with, with those people that they were not supposed to be, they're not supposed to be um, influenced by, they were being influenced. And what ends up happening is, is they end up in rebellion. And so the sin cycle, four things to remember, you could write it down, is, is it begins with rebellion, rebelling against the ways of God that God lays it out. And they had all kinds of excuses, just like people do today. 
there's rebellion, and then there's retribution. And retribution means the judgment of God begins to call, come. The judgment of God begins to fall. And the judgment all has to be even is God removing his hand of blessing, right? The judgment of God begins to fall on the people. And then after the judgment of God falls on the people, then there's this series of, of uh, um, they become enslaved to other nations. They go through this whole process. Ret retribution is God lifts his hand of protection. The outside nations come in, attack them, take them sometimes into you know captivity. And then they repent. After they repent from that and they, they repent from what they've done, then God sends restoration through one of the judges. Okay, so it's not a judge like Judge Judy with a little gavel. This, no, this is a judge that is, is used. Um, think rescuer, okay? And uh, God sends, you know, a, a rescuer in to deliver his people from these nations that would be, you know, be attacking them or something like that. And so that's what we're going to read about. So let's start with Judges chapter 1, verse 3. Uh, chapter one, chapters one through three, it says after the death of Joshua the Israelite, asked the the Israelites asked the Lord, who of us is to go up first to fight against the Canaanites? The Lord answered, Judah shall go up. I have given the land into their hands. And the men of Judah then said to the Simeonites, their fellow Israelites, come up with us into the territory allotted to us to fight against the Canaanites. We in turn will give will go with you into yours. So the Simeonites went with them. When Judah attacked, the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands, and they struck down 10,000 men at Bezek. It, it was there that they found Adonai Bezek and fought, uh, fought against him, putting to rout the Canaanites and Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they chased him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Then Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off, toes cut off have picked up scraps under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. They brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. The men of Judah attacked Jerusalem also and took it. They put the city to the sword and set it on fire. And after that, Judah went down to fight against Canaanites living in the hill country, the Negev and the western foothills. They advanced against the Canaanites living in Hebron, formerly called Kiriath Arba, and defeated Sheshai, Ahemon, and Talmai. From there, they advanced against the people living in Deber, formerly called Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, I will give my daughter Aksa in marriage to the man who attacks and captures Kiriath Sefer. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. So Caleb gave his daughter Aksa to him in marriage. One day when she came to Othniel, she urged him to ask her father for a field. When she got off her donkey, Caleb asked her, what can I do for you? She replied, do me a special favor. Since you have given me land in the Negev, give me also Spring, spring, springs of water. So Caleb gave her the upper and lower springs. The descendants of Moses's father-in-law, the Kenite, went up from the city of Palms with the people of Judah to live among the inhabitants of the desert of the desert of Judah in the Negev near Arad. Then the men of Judah went with the Simeonites, their fellow Israelites, and attacked the Canaanites living in Zephath, and they totally destroyed the city. Therefore, it was called Hormah. Judah also took Gaza, Eshkelon, and Ekron, each city with its territory. The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had chariots fitted with iron. As Maz Moses had promised, Hebron was given to Caleb, who drove from it three sons of Anak. The Benjamites, however, did not drive out the Jebusites, who were living in Jerusalem. And to this day, the Jebusites live there with the Benjamites. Now the tribes of Joseph attacked Bethel, and the Lord was with them. When they sent men to spy out Bethel, formerly called Luz, the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Show us how to get into the city, and we will see that you are treated well. So he showed them, and they put the, whole, put the city to the sword, but spared the man and his whole family. He then went to the land of the Hittites, where he, was, he built a city and called it Luz, which is its name to this day. But Manasseh did not drive out the people of Bethshan, or Tanakh, or Dor, or Iblim, or Megiddo, and their surrounding settlements, for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor, but never drove them out completely. Nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites living in Gezer, but the Canaanites continued to live there, live there among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites living in Kitron or Nehalal. So these Canaanites lived among them, but Zebulun did subject them to forced labor, nor did Asher drive out those living Echo or Sidon or Kealab or Exib or Helba 
or Aphek or Rehob. The Asherites lived there, lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land because they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh or Beth Anath. But the Naphtalites too lived among the Canaanites inhabitants of the land, and those living in the Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath became forced laborers for them. The Amorites confined the Danites to the hill country, not allowing them to come down into the plain. And the Amorites were determined also to hold out in Mount Heres, Ajalon, and Shelbim. But when the power of the tribes of Joseph increased, they too were forced, pressed into forced labor. The boundary of the Amorites was from Scorpion Pass to Selah and beyond. And the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land. But you shall break down their altars, yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I have also said, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares to you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud, and they called that place Bokim. There they offered sacrifices to the Lord. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elder, elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his, his inheritance at Timnath Heres in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him. I want you to see this again. They buried him in the land of the inheritance. Now look at what happens. Verse 10, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped uh, various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of the raiders who plundered them. And so I want to just pause for a moment and, and, and bring out that here's the beginning of this, this sin cycle, right? They begin to, to live in rebellion uh, against God's commands um, by intermarrying, by worshiping the false gods, and by making treaties with the people. And it began with making treaties with the people, which, by the way, it's important to see that. They began to inter intermix with the people. And they should have driven him out, like God said. And it wasn't that God wouldn't. When you look at him, why, why didn't they drive out the people? They should have driven them out, um, completely out. But because they didn't drive the people out, and they allowed them to live among them, what happens is they begin then to make treaties with them. They begin to do commerce with them. They begin to, to you know, interact with them so much that then they begin to worship their false gods. And when that happened, um, the living in rebellion. It, it says the Lord, he, he, in his anger, um, he gave them into the hands of raiders and plundered them. And, um, so this is a really, you, uh, you should underline, I mean, encourage you underline verses 10, um, all the way through verse 14. After that generation, it all begins, look at verse 10. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. They fail to pass on, even to the next generation, what God intended, what God had done. Um, the, the, the generation of elders and leaders, they failed to pass on what they needed to to their children. All right, let's keep going. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all, all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them, just as he had sworn sworn to them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. And they quickly turned from the way of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. <clears throat> Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of their hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under who, under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to the ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors. If 
following other gods and serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, because this nation has violated the covenant I ordained for those ancestors and have not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. The, the Lord had allowed those nations to remain he did not drive them out at once by giving them into the hands of Joshua. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He this, did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of Israelite, of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. The five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonites, and Hivites living in the Lebanon mountains from Mount Baal, Hermon, to Lebo, Hamath, they were left to test Israel the Israelites, to see whether they would obey the Lord's commands, which he had given their ancestors through Moses. The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perivites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of the Cushite, Brethium king of Aram Neherim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who, um, who saved them. The spirit of the Lord came on him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cush Rehatham, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because they, they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, the king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. The Israelites sent him to the, with tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab, who was a very fat man. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images, on the reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. And the king said to his attendants, Leave us, and they all left. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade, and his bowels discharged. Ehud did, did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed in over it. Then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. After he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked, and they said he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. There they saw their lord fall into the floor dead. While they waited, Ehud got, Ehud got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped to Syrah. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab, your enemy, into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. And at that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong, and not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. After Ehud came Shamgar, Shamgar son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad, and he too saved Israel. So again, just just a moment of um, commentary, if I can, just just to encourage us, we have we have got to see and understand that when when the the people of God, when they forget what God has done, when they lose sight of the commands of God, they end up living in rebellion, and with rebellion comes retribution. There there are consequences to our behavior. And um, the, we'll, we'll end up 
finding the Lord fighting against us. Trust me, friends, there, there are some who have really very, very poor uh, biblical doctrine. And they would say, no, the Lord would never fight against us. We live now in a, in a, in a time of grace. Listen, it was grace that brought the Israelites to the promised land in the first place. It was grace that offered them the opportunity to have atonement for their sins through their sacrificial system. It was the grace of God that moved them out of the Red Sea from captivity and into freedom. It was grace that brought them there. And, and God give them, gave them some very specific commands. And um, the truth is God gives us commands still today. And one of the commands that God gives us is that we are to be um, in the world, but not of the world. We are not to follow the false gods of this world, materialism and, um, you know, making alliances and allegiances with people who are ungodly. And yet we do. And what happens is, is when we do, we end up being taken captive by this world and we end up losing entire generations of people. And then God raises up people, raises up people, um, you know, to uh, to go in, judges, if you will, to go in and to uh, to begin to rescue people. But uh, let's no make make no mistake in that you know we still continue to live that sin cycle out um, as a people, and one wonders why in the world the world is so bad right now. Well, you know, we wonder if uh, if maybe it's not time for God's people to uh, um, to begin to purify themselves and repent um, of their sins and call out to God and ask God to uh, to um, to rescue us. Uh, but we've got to be serious about our um, our repentance. And then we can enter times of peace like the people of Israel did. All right, let's jump over to uh, to Psalm 69, and we're going to read the first uh, 18 verses. It says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths, while there, there is no foothold. I've come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I'm worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail, looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause, those who seek to destroy me. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. You, God, know my folly. My guilt is not hidden from you. Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. God of Israel, may those who seek me, seek you, not be put to shame because of me. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. For zeal for your house consumes me. And the insults of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I am the song of drunkards. But I pray to you, Lord, in the time of your favor and your great love, O God, answer me with your sure salvation. Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. De deliver me from those who hate me, from the deep waters. Do not let the floodgates engulf me or the depths swallow me up or the pit closed its mouth over me. Answer me, Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Come near and rescue me. Deliver me because of my foes. Um, you know, a powerful psalm here that uh, that David is crying out. And uh, it, verse 9, he says, For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insult, insults of those who insult you fall on me. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe again, that's part of what we need to, you know, we, we live in a land in a world that, uh, that insults God, insults God terribly. There's so much that's done that's insulting to a holy God. And I think it's appropriate for the people of God to begin to, to have those things that insult God, insult us. Not way that we turn with bitterness, but we, we become, we've got to understand the distinction between righteous and unrighteous. And, and those things that insult God should impact us greatly in our hearts. Where our hearts, they, when we see something, when we hear something, when we experience something, and it's not of God, it should, it should grab a hold of our hearts. So let's pray that, can we, that, that God would restore a sensitivity of our hearts, that we would follow him. All right, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, we thank you for this Good Friday. It's a reminder, Lord, of how much you've loved us and, and all that you've done for us in rescuing us, Lord, out of our slavery. And uh, Lord, I pray that as you've rec rescued us out of our slavery, God, that we would truly be dip deeply impacted by that. And, and Lord, that we would uh, be faithful in following you, that we would not return back to our slavery. 
but God, that the grace that you offer to us would um, would call us to uh, to deep repentance and uh, desiring for uh, God uh, a life that honors you and rest and honors you and and uh, is lived out for you. And God, would you help us to have a sensitivity, Lord, in our heart um, against those things that that are against you, um, Lord? Help us to to feel it. Help us to to not um, ignore it. And uh, Lord, just give us a deep sensitivity um, in our spirits, Lord, of of um, those things that 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 hurt your heart, God, and and uh, Lord, do not align with you. And Lord, help us to stay away from them. Help us, God, not to make allegiances with this world. And um, Lord, this world is not our home. And uh, and help us, Lord, to see the seriousness of all of this. And God, not to uh, to give our children in our uh, in intermarriage, Lord. Um, uh, God, to those who are not godly and those who are not serving you. And uh, Lord, help us to not make vows and treaties, Lord. Um, help us to not um, be so close to the world, Lord, that we become like them. And uh, God, that almost sounds like a foreign prayer these days. But Lord, help us to 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 be separate, God. Um, Lord, certainly we have to live among the people, but Lord, help us to not live as the people. And, uh, and so that we we can be righteous and pure and we can point people towards you. And uh, God, that people would repent and find restoration through you. Uh, but Lord, we just we thank you, God, for the opportunity to, to live as salt and light in this world. Lord, I pray you would help us to do that. God, we love you. Thank you again for your sacrifice that you've made for us that we could even be restored and rescued, Lord. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, thank you. And I uh, hope you have a wonderful day. We have a good Friday service if you are in uh, in the area. Um, if not, um, I hope you have a wonderful uh, good Friday and a, a wonderful Easter weekend. All right. We'll see you tomorrow.